Commissioner, the next witness is Mr. Glenfield. Yes. if you'd come into the witness box and if I can ask you whether you would prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation. Affirmation, please. Yes. Aff affirm the witness, please. Please repeat after me. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Do sit down, Mr. Glenfield. Yes, Mr. Dick. Thanks, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Glenfield, is your full name Stephen Edward Glenfield? Yes, it is. And uh, your current business address uh, is the APRA offices at 535 Burke Street in Melbourne? It is. Uh, could you tell the Commissioner your current position uh, in APRA? I'm a general manager of the Specialised Institutions Division. And uh, have you received a summons to appear at this round of the hearings of the Commission? I have. Do you have the summons with you? I do. I, I tender the summons, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 5.301, summons to Mr Glenfield. <coughs> and Mr Glenfield, um, you've prepared a witness statement dated the 14th of August 2018 for this round of hearings? I have, yes. Um, and do you have that statement with you? I do. And um, are the contents of the statement true and correct to the best of your belief? They are, yes. Um, Mr Commissioner, I tender the statement in the exhibit. The statement and exhibits to the statement of Mr Glenfield uh, of 14 August 18 is exhibit 5.302. Thank you, Mr Dick. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Glenfield, what I want to ask you some questions about is IOOF and in your statement you have given some evidence about the dealings between APRA and IOOF. I have, yes. And could you just explain your role in relation to the dealings between APRA and IOOF? Okay, um, my role was as General Manager of South West Region, uh, which is the region covering Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, which supervise a range of institutions across superannuation, banking, etc. cetera. Uh, one of the institutions within that was IOOF. So we have a supervisory team that supervises IOOF. I'm the, their general manager. You're the what, sorry? The general manager. I see. Sorry, I should have And agreed. this is, as we understand it, an ongoing issue. Is that right? IOOF? Yes. Yes, it is. <coughs> now, You've given some evidence about the issue that arose with respect to Questor and the Cash Management Trust. I have, yes. I just want to make sure we're, at least to begin with, in agreement about the relevant background. Questor was, it may still technically be, a subsidiary of IOOF Holdings? Yes, it was. And it was both the trustee of a superannuation fund and the responsible entity for at least two managed investment schemes? A dual regulated entity, yes. Just need to break yeah, no, it. Sorry, okay, yes, sorry. So it was the responsible entity for the IDPS-like yes. scheme? Correct. Does that ring a bell for you? It does, yes. And it was also the responsible entity for the Cash Management Trust? It was, yes. And as the trustee, it invested some of the assets of the superannuation fund in the Cash Management Trust? It did, yes. And as the responsible entity of the IDPS-like scheme, it invested some of the assets of that scheme in the Cash Management Trust? It did, yes. And there was then an issue, which was that an amount of money back in 2009 was incorrectly recorded as income rather than an asset. That's correct. And 
it was then distributed to then members of the Cash Management Trust. Also correct. And then at some point in time, Questor instituted a process to try to claw back that money that it had incorrectly distributed. Correct. And the way in which it went about doing that was from September 2011, it reduced the unit price, or I'm sorry, the distribution that was being paid from units in the cash management trust. Correct. And in that way, over the course of three years, it sought to effectively claw back the over distribution. Correct. But to do that, not from the people to whom it had distributed the money in the first place, but rather from the people who were current members or currently invested in the CMT. They might be the same in some cases. Yeah, no, I was about to say it would include some who had had the over distribution, but others who had joined since that weren't part of that. And <coughs> when did APRA first become aware of that issue? Um, APRA uh, and my, the supervision team identified it during a, uh, I think, a review of um, audit papers or risk and compliance papers in about 2011, I think, or 2011-12. I, I can't recall. It's in the it's in the statement of the date escapes me. Sorry, it's was, in the statement when yeah, it was. Yeah, it was post the event. At some stage, APRA identified the fact that this had occurred. Yes. And you're saying that was done before there was any notification of that fact by, by IOOF or Questor to APRA? Correct. And when did APRA first become, or first take steps then to contact Questor about this? Um, I'm trying to recall. We. As part of our review, we did an on-site review of um, Idlelife Questor around about early 2016, I think is the review report that goes out where we've reviewed the actions taken to remediate. I just want to make sure we're not yeah. losing some time, misunderstanding the time. If we bring up your statement in yep. paragraph Thank you. 105. <coughs> Page 23, 23 thank you. <clears throat> so There you speak about APRA's 21 December 2015 Prudential Review Report. Correct. And then over the page on paragraph 106, you say APRA wrote to Questor on 23 June 2016 seeking clarity around the cash management trust over distribution matter? Correct. Do you think that APRA was aware of the issue before about mid-2016 or you're not no. sure? No. Um, we would have identified it shortly uh, before that but then gone out to see them quickly once we'd identified. So you probably identified the issue in about 2016? Yeah, and then, that. And then went and saw them about it? Mm -hmm and then wrote to them? Wrote to them, yes. And the issue had further progressed by the time you got to it because Questor had implemented its remediation approach. Correct. And its remediation approach was that it had reached a settlement with the former custodian? 
It had, yes. And it had received effectively half of the amount that it needed to compensate members of the trust and I'm sorry, members of the superannuation fund and the IDPS like scheme from the former custodian. Correct. And it used that settlement monies to fully compensate the members of the IDPS like scheme. This is the RA, yes. And then it used the balance of those settlement monies plus the general reserve of the superannuation fund to compensate the members of the superannuation fund. That's correct. And just so I make sure we agree about this, do we agree that the reserve is an asset of the fund? We do. And do we agree that the trustee holds the assets of the fund on trust for the members? We do. And do we agree that the general reserve then, although not allocated to any specific member, belongs to the members? I do. And there are going to be certain circumstances set out in the relevant policies in which the trustee can use the reserve for certain purposes. Correct. And is it fair to say the concern that APRA had on becoming aware of what Questor had done was that rather than using its own funds to compensate the members where it appeared at least arguable that it was at fault, Questor had used the reserve which belonged to the members to compensate the members. <coughs> uh, I think, I think APRA had a dual concern. Um, the first was the distribution of the, the compensation from NAS, as it was at, at the time, in that it had, give, it had at, with its RE hat on, it had distributed 100% for the IDPS-like and then the remainder to the superannuation fund members. Uh, with its RE hat on, our concern was that it, it, it may have had an obligation to actually balance the interests of the two in the distribution. So would you give all to the, to the, um, oh, I have to get rid of, to the IDPS crew and, and less to APRA? We were concerned that that was not correct. Then from the um, position of the trustee, um, having received compensation that was less than the full amount, we were concerned that they were not, um, as with their RSEL hat on, looking to action to the RE to get full compensation for the trustee members. And this issue, in, once it was identified in 2016, was the third issue of a similar kind that APRA had identified within the space of the last, or well, the preceding six or seven months. So there was a, there, there were two others. One was, I think, called Pursuit. It was a sweep for an error that had been made. Um, and there was one other, yes. And if we go to exhibit SG1-17, which is APRA.0002.0003.0698, This is an earlier letter sent in December of 2015 to the directors of IOOF Holdings by APRA. Correct, yes. And if we go to page, we'll bring up pages 0703 and 0704 on the screen at the same time. We see in this earlier letter APRA raising a concern about those two earlier incidents, one which was an issue with IML in relation to the pursuit redistribution breach. 
Yes. And the other in relation to Questor for the TPS regular investment sweep breach. Yes. And the point that is made, if you go over the page to page.0704, is that the non-superannuation members were compensated by the company operator, whereas the superannuation members were compensated from their own monies via the operational risk financial <coughs> reserve. Correct. And APRA's point is it's very hard to see how a decision to compensate beneficiaries in this manner aligns with the covenant in 52.2D. Correct. And do you want to just explain to the Commissioner what 52.2D is? Um, in acting in the best interest of members, um, I didn't feel that the, the way that they had dealt with it was appropriate. I think 52.2D relates to conflicts of interest, doesn't it, and preferring the interests of the members yep. or the absolute obligation to act in the interests of the members. Correct. And APRA's point, if I can summarise it, is if the company makes a mistake, then it is that causes loss to the members, then it is not in the best interests of the members and not preferring the interests of the members to use the reserve funds, which are part of the trust, to compensate them rather than having the company pay for its mistake? Um, uh, to me, I would expect, whilst you can possibly use the reserve to put the members back to the position they should be in immediately, you would nonetheless follow up the RE for compensation. Except in this case, the RE is the trustee. Which is the great challenge, yes. Which is the what, Which sorry? is the challenge in that, in that structure. It seems actually like it's not much of a challenge at all in the sense that if the company is acting properly in accordance with its statutory obligations, it just has to put its hand into its pocket and compensate the members for its mistake. If from, a, from an RSEL viewpoint, they should be seeking that from the, from the RE. And this is, as I say, December 2015. The cash management trust issue isn't going to be recorded for another six months or so. But the approach of IOOF remained an ongoing concern, can I suggest, for APRA in the intervening six months? Yes, I would agree with that. And I think you referred to having, that there would have been a meeting with IOOF. Can we bring up APRA.0002.0004.6714? So this is APRA's file note of a meeting that was held on the 24th of March 2016 between APRA and IOOF. It looks like a, a file note from the Prudential consultation, which was held with the board. And you attended that? I did, yes. And do you recall the meeting now? I do, yes. And one of the issues which is has been identified by this stage, if we look at the fifth bullet point, is the Cash Management Trust. It said, discussion regarding the CMT Board believes that the compensation from NAB went into the general reserve, which then paid both retail and super members. Therefore, there was no inequality. APRA noted that this wasn't so much the issue, but rather the rectification plan, which saw IML skim returns of all superannuation members. I see that, yes. Now, that probably suggests that at that time, both sides may not have fully understood what had occurred because Certainly, the payment from NAB, the former custodian, didn't go into the General Reserve. Yeah, I mean, correct. We've moved on since then. The General Reserve couldn't have been used to pay retail customers because, or retail members because the General Reserve is in the super fund? Um, on the presumption, and I don't know the answer to it, that that General Reserve they're referring to is the General Reserve of the super fund. That is correct. So I don't... I'm, I'm not 
fully understand. clear if there's a general reserve in the other fund. In the what, sorry? I wasn't I'm, to the point, I'm not clear if there is a other general reserve in the group named general reserve, but if we make the presumption that it's the general reserve in the super fund, then you are correct. And it wasn't Immel that was skimming the returns of superannuation members, it was Quest or? In terms of skimming, please. Sorry? In what way skimming? That, that's what um, APRA has recorded. The rectification plan which saw Immel skim returns of all superannuation members. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I haven't written the notes, so I don't know what that's getting at. All right. And then if we go over the page to dot 6717, This is the note of APRA's view of culture. Correct, yes. And it said, if we see in the third paragraph, IOOF operate their superannuation business within a silo and appear to be insulated from the rest of the superannuation industry with views which are not consistent with the industry or best practice. Yes. And the board and management have been seen to make decisions which appear to favour shareholders above superannuation members a legalistic approach to decision making is often taken with a means to shield IOOF from obligations which may be in members' best interests. Yes, so go on. Go on. Oh, at the meeting, part of what we were trying to do was to get the, um, the board and management of IOOF to be more interactive with APRA um, in a way that we've generally found with other funds. And so this is recording what APRA would have said to IOOF at that meeting? Our, our EGM, Keith Chapman, led that discussion, yes. And this reflects your general recollection of what was said to IOOF at the meeting? It does, yes. Now then, as you've noted in your witness statement, then in June there is the letter sent to, from APRA to A to IOOF concerning the cash management trust issue? Yes. And <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner, I tender that file note. File note of meeting between APRA and IOOF, 24 March 16, APRA 0002-0046714, Exhibit 5.303. And then in July of 2016, there is a memo that is sent from a principal analyst to you. Can we bring up APRA.0002.0004.5205? Is the analyst the supervisor in relation to IOOF? That's correct. And do you receive memos from the supervisors informing you of where things are at? Uh, I think this memo was preparing me for a meeting that we had with the board coming up. I see. And I just want to direct you to, if we go to page.5206, we see paragraph 11 supervision's assessment is that IOOF's decision to appoint two additional non-executive directors on the board has been done to appease APRA. From the information received to date, it appears that IOOF does not intend to engage in genuine and critical consideration as to how it will structure its governance framework going forward to ensure it better delivers upon its obligations to members, beneficiaries. Yes. And um, would you like some context around that? Sure. Okay. So. We had done, I think there was the previous off-site review, which is the 215. Uh, as part of the response to that, IOOF had given us a commitment to review their governance frameworks. Uh, the team, which we would have expected was a, a, a wide-ranging governance framework review, the team was concerned that that framework review was not going to be as in-depth as we wanted and was more relying on the appointment of two independent directors to meet the governance issues it's highlighting to me that we would expect them to do more. And the view of the supervisor that's expressed here, is that a view that you shared? Um, at the point that came to me, that was the first briefing of where they'd got to. Um, this was to go to the meeting with the board 
to, to discuss what they were actually doing with the framework with a view to pushing them to go further. In December of 2016, there was a letter that APRA sent to the directors of Questor concerning the CMT issue, and that is exhibit SG-1-39 to your statement. It's APRA.0002.0006.2432. So this is the letter that APRA sends, and I think you're the signatory, if we bring I up page.2434. Yes. Page and here you are expressing on behalf of APRA the view that the use of TPS Superfund general reserve monies to compensate TPS Superfund members for a loss caused by Questor as responsible entity of the CMT is inappropriate. I agree. And you said that acting in the best interests of the Superfund members, Questor ought to immediately replenish the general reserves using utilising its funds as responsible entity. I agree. And you then said a failure by Questor to appropriately replenish TPS Superfund's general reserve will escalate APRA's concerns in respect of Questor meeting its prudential fiduciary and legislative obligations and may lead APRA to further scrutinise Questor's commitment to prioritising the best interests of its superannuation members. I did, yes. Was there some enforcement process that was in contemplation by APRA at that time? So the, the view that I'd taken at that point was I was of the view, and it's the consistent view that I think that you've expressed when you were with IOOF, was that they were, that it was member money being used to compensate, and I didn't think that was appropriate. Um, we took, I took internal legal advice at the time to confirm my view, which we obtained. So I, on the basis of that, I, my view was that if they didn't replenish, that we should consider whether that w there was an action that could be taken for them not doing so, yes, which we referred to our enforcement committee to look at. And what is the action that was under contemplation? Uh, I was open at the point, but part of that could have been a range of matters. You could have been a direction, um, it could have been taking action against individuals, but I was open to saying that we would go to a more um, forceful set of actions than, than the traditional style or the way that we were supervising it at the time. If we then go to SG1-40, this is the letter that you received in response from Mr Kelleher of IOOF? Correct, yes. I'm sorry, that's APRA.0007.0002.1765. And IOOF refused to replenish the general reserve funds? They did, yes. Out of curiosity, had IOOF been asked to replenish the ORFR in the case of the earlier issues that had been identified? No, I hadn't at that point. You hadn't asked them to do that? No. And if we go to page.1766, You see in the bottom half of the page, APRA's made various statements about options that had apparently been considered by a rectification committee. I do, yes. Did APRA undertake any investigations to see whether there was any factual basis for these statements? No, we didn't. And then 
If we go to page 1769. We see the conclusion of what Mr. Kelleher says is the final and most relevant fact, which is that at no time has Questor received any demands for compensation or complaint about its remediation and compensation plans from any member of the TPS Super Fund. I do. Did you have any reason to think that an ordinary member of the fund would have any idea what had happened? No, I didn't. And. Then Mr Kelleher says, in terms of the so-called pub test, which in these circumstances is a proxy for members' best interests, it is the board's view that the test has been passed? I do, and I didn't support that view. I don't support that view. You don't think the pub test is, in any sense, a way of explaining the best interest duty? No, I think the best interest duty is clear under the, under the relevant act. And there was another issue, wasn't there, which was that one of the things that IWF seemed to not understand was that there wasn't a question of balancing competing interests under the CIS Act. What was required was that they prioritise the interests of the members of the super fund. And I'd written to them on that. And you wrote to them and pointed that out. I did, yes. And this is April of 2017. Correct. Then in May of 2017, there's an internal memo to the Escalation and Enforcement Committee. Can we bring that up? That's APRA.0002.0007.3851. So see, this is dated the 19th of May, 2017. I do, yes. Are you on the Escalation and Enforcement Committee? No, I'm not. Do you, or were you aware of this memorandum being sent? Um, I've, I've seen and reviewed the memo. <laughs> In the course of preparing to give evidence, or you saw it at the time? Um, I saw it after the Enforcement Committee. Oh, no, I can't recall if I saw the memo before the Enforcement Committee meeting or shortly after, but I have seen it, yes. And if we go to page dot three eight five two, we see there's proposed strategy, and the second paragraph under that heading says frontlines current view, and I should just confirm frontline means effectively the supervisor. Effectively is that my right? team, yes. Sorry, did you say and your team or so effectively my it is my team. Front your line. team is yes. frontline. Correct. Frontline supervisors. Frontline's current view is that whilst IOOF have established a reasonable conflicts management framework, they have yet to properly implement the framework. Consequently, Frontline are concerned that a continued failure by IOOF to implement their conflicts management framework will lead to further instances where IOOF prefer the interests of its other entities, shareholders, over those of its superannuation members, such as took place in the CMT over distribution matter. Yes, so that's based on our on-site reviews. So uh, IWF had done considerable work around uh, changing their framework in terms of documentation. Our on-site review, uh, we concluded that it, it wasn't fully bedded down and operating, so we retained concerns. That is, they had recorded in writing a framework that appeared to be satisfactory to APRA? So I think the framework appeared satisfactory. I think there were conclusions that the, at general level the staff were um, putting that into play well, but we had concerns remaining at the board level. If we go to page dot three eight five four, we see next steps, which are that there'll be a prudential review on the twenty ninth and thirtieth of May. Yes, I do. And it will then follow that APRA will then will look at whether it has sufficient evidence in the, in the event that the use of coercive powers are deemed to be necessary. I do. At this point then, 
APRA's view is we haven't reached the point where we would use coercive powers? No, not yet. Um, I think at this point, so we've had probably two main reviews around, well, around that area in terms of we did a desk review, which was the 2015, which is looking at the policies and procedures, looking at the minutes and reviewing what's there, which in our mind identified concerns which we wrote to the board about and asked them to, to address. We then went out, followed that up with the following review, which was going on site to confirm whether what they've said they've done is actually playing out, because in, in anything we do, it's one thing to write it down, it's another thing to actually see it playing out and that it's actually being complied with and we raise concerns from there. Um, at this point, for me, I've, having met the board and gone through it, they've had a number of reviews being done by externals which aren't identifying issues to them. But our view is that we still see issue. So I'm still looking for a corroborative piece to support APRA's view to give me a very strong case to go forward. And you'll, you may well come to it later. Part of that review is Ernst & Young coming in independently to review the operations of the framework. So looking for an external view that supports APRA's view, because remembering the APRA view is a two or three day review, it's not an extensive <coughs> there for weeks and weeks. We've got EY coming in to do a very deep dive review. Those two together could well corroborate to give the full extent of the evidence needed. There's two separate issues though here, aren't there? One is, I think, the issue that you're talking about, which is there is an ongoing concern of APRA about the adequacy of the governance and management frameworks that IOOF has in place. Agree. And there's a separate issue, which is, has there been some breach of the law in relation to what has happened with the Questor Cash Management Trust issue, yep. the pursuit breach and the sweep breach. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Agree. And at this point in time, what happens to those specific breaches? So the, the Questor, we, um, we refer to the Enforcement Committee, which has got our general counsel, our head of enforcement on it, who took uh, internal legal advice on likelihood of success in pursuing that matter. Um, that came back, the legal advice came back that it was complex. There were a number of, there are a number of matters that made it less than clear cut. Uh, so not to pursue at that point, but to bring it into the broader review that we're doing of IWF at the time. Do you accept that for most regulators, not every case that they will commence in a court will be clear cut 90% cer certainty of success? Um, I'd accept that, but in, in this case, the advice was that we didn't have enough to take the case forward. Um, I accepted the legal advice. Well, one of the things you say in your statement is that you form the view that the reserve policy permitted Questor to use the money for this purpose? The Questor policy, as I understood it, allows for payment for compensation. Um, so our, the team that reviewed that uh, concluded that, yes. Yes, and I think you say this, if we bring up pages 24 and 25 of your statement, I'm sorry, Commissioner, I tender that document. Memo to Escalation and Enforcement Committee, 19 May 2017, APRA, 0002, 0007, 3851, Exhibit 5.304. And if we bring up Mr Glenfield's statement, pages 24 and 25, paragraph 109, across those two pages. Just 
So this is where you explain the reasons why you decided not to take action? Yes, these were the reasons that came through the EEC, yes. One was that APRA didn't have a power to direct that the reserve be replenished? As advised, yes. And that's, I mean, that's the case. You can't just direct them to do it at the moment. Correct. The second is that Questor's reserves policy permitted the use of the general reserve to compensate members? Yes. Do you know whether anybody checked what the version of Questor's reserves policy was at the time that the decision was made? No, I'm not aware. We suspect that you might have looked at a reserves policy which If we bring up the version which is the 19 August 2013 version, so this is IFL.00027.0001.0746. So you see, this is the reserves policy as at 19 August 2013. Yes. And then if we go to page five, which is dot zero seven five zero. See the general reserve, which is at the bottom of the page. The general reserve exists to hold capital to pay future administration and operational expenses under the funds trust deeds and cannot be directly attributed to the members. The reserve may be utilised for any purpose that the trustee deems appropriate and within the parameters disclosed by the fund's trustees. Yes, I see that. Have you ever looked at the reserves policy? Me personally, no. I tender that version of the reserves policy, Commissioner. Reserves policy as at 19 August 13. IFL 0027-0001-0746, Exhibit 5.305. Now, you recall that the decision as to, or the decision as to what was done in relation to how the members was compensated was made in 2015? Yes. And then if we bring up IFL. Double zero two seven dot triple zero one dot zero seven three seven. So this is the reserves policy. You'll see this is as at twenty five May two thousand and seventeen. I do. And by this time, Questor has is no longer operating, so it's fallen off the list. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to page dot zero seven four zero. So you see now the general reserve policy has been amended and I don't know if it would help if we bring up both versions and put one on either side of the screen, it probably would. So can we put that page on the right side of the screen and on the left side of the screen put <laughs> IFL.0027.0001.0750? And you see Whereas, as at 2013, there was a reference to the reserve existing to pay future administration and operational expenses under the fund's trustees. I do, yes. And now when we go over to purpose, it's now said the purpose of the general reserve is to hold capital that cannot be directly 
attributed to members which has been set aside for a clearly stated purpose that the trustee deems appropriate as determined by the fund's trustees. I do. And then if you look at the section which is use, you see the reserve may be utilised for the purpose that the trustee deems appropriate and within the parameters disclosed by the fund's trustees and relevant regulatory requirements, for example, but not limited to, and then you see the third bullet point is the payment of compensation to members. I do. And then if we go to page.0745. On the right hand or left hand document? On the right hand, Commissioner. We can see this is the document history for the document and we see that last printed date which is 19 August 2013 which is that original date for the reserves policy. I do, yes. And then we see in the revision history, in, it was in version 3, revised on the 25th of May 2016, that there was, amongst other things, the inclusion of uses for reserves including examples. Yes. Do you know whether anybody at APRA had detected that the reserve policy had been amended to permit the payment of compensation from the reserve to members after the reserve had already been used to pay compensation to members? Not aware. I would need to ask the people who reviewed. I tender that the later version of the policy, Commissioner. IWF reserves policy at 25 May 17 IFL 0027 001 0737 exhibit 5.306. And then if we go back to your statement and page 25 of that statement. So we've spoken about the first reason, we've spoken about the second reason. As to the third reason, which is whilst TPS was disadvantaged by the use of the general reserve, its members were not directly disadvantaged as affected members were compensated appropriately. But yes. Now, that can I suggest rather avoids the issue because the issue is that if Questor, as responsible entity of the CMT, was responsible for the loss, it should have been paying for that loss rather than Questor in its capacity as trustee of the super fund using the reserve of the super fund to compensate the members. I think that's a point that I've made to them, but in terms, I think of that point is looking at that in terms of the individual's accounts, it currently has been recompensed to the amount that they should have. For me, the issue is that it came from the general reserve, which ultimately is an asset of the fund, rather than them seeking from the RE, consistent with what you're saying. Yes. They've, the members have been disadvantaged because the general reserve that belongs to them, though is not specifically attributable to any of them, has been depleted. They are disadvantaged by its depletion, but in terms of them gaining access to that money, it's not going to occur in an immediate future. It would likely be on a wind-up or something similar. So at, the, at that point, the members have in their account the money they're entitled to. What we're seeking to see is that we can try to re, sorry, re recompense the general reserve for the amount that was taken out of it. Or a more immediate way in which they would be disadvantaged is that the reserve ought to be used to meet some operational or administrative expenses and it's not available to do that and so instead the trustee imposes some additional fee on the members. That presumes that such an event takes place, yes. Yes, but that's the imposition of additional fees in order to meet unexpected costs or costs of complying with regulation is something that 
retail trustees have done regularly over the last few years, haven't they? So can you repeat that for me? The imposition of some additional fee in order to meet unexpected costs or the costs of complying with some regulatory changes is something that retail trustees have done regularly over the last few years. Um, okay, so my, my portfolio has minimal retail funds, so I can't speak for that. All right. Now, did you ever respond to the pub test letter? Um, I can't recall what we, we I think we took that on to our next review, so that that formed the basis. Well, I did. I mean, we didn't accept the response as being correct. We've gone back out and done another review, and I think I'll have, to have a look. We'll, we'll go through it. I'm sure. Um, reiterated, our, reiterated our position around it. So we've, yeah. We've. Do you think it was a breach of the sole purpose test to use the reserve funds to compensate members? rather than look to the company in a different capacity? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I would need to take advice on whether it's a breach of the sole purpose, but what I, I did think it was was not acting in the best interests, and I've continued to pursue that. And you what, sorry? We've continued to pursue them. Well, you didn't, though, did you? You didn't continue to pursue this issue. In terms of Questor itself, it's yes. because Questor is gone, but it's been taken into the way we're with well, the way we're supervising IWF as a group going forward. Did you pursue Imel in relation to the pursuit breach? No. If you were going to pursue them by some enforcement strategy, would that require seeking an injunction? from the court to compel them to comply with their best interest? <coughs> I would need to take legal advice to answer that question. Can we then bring up APRA.0016.0001.0730? <coughs> so this is another internal memorandum to you? Yes. And this is from Ms Lee, who is the supervisor, and Mr Davies, who is from Resolution and Enforcement. Yes. And they were now together expressing concerns, a multitude of concerns, about the governance and complex management of IWF. Um, yeah, if I can see the rest of the memo, please. Yes. If there's a copy of it, then I'd be happy for that to be provided to Mr. Glenfield. This is a memo preparing me for a board meeting. A meeting with the board of yep. IWS. So, well, this is coming out of the review that's done that we issue the review report on. We were going to see the board to take them through. Um, was going with actually going with Juliet, and she was she and Anthony were briefing me ahead of that for what the issues were they'd found. And they were explaining their concerns about a number of issues in relation to governance and complex management at IWF. Correct. And they were concerned, for example, if we go to page dot zero seven three two that the IWF board has a fundamental misunderstanding of its duty to prioritise the duties to and interests of superannuation fund members. Yes. That IWF view themselves as an advice business rather than a superannuation trustee business. Oh, yes, sorry. If we go over the page, that IWF do not see a clear nexus between themselves and the member when it comes to investments. Yes. That IWF directors have difficulty identifying conflicts and arrangements with related parties. Yes. 
we go over the page to 0734, that IOOF directors are at risk of abrogating their obligations on conflict management by a delegation to committee without appropriate oversight. Yes. That the IOOF board does not view compliance and conflicts management as areas that matter. Yes. That conflicts management considerations are not adequately documented and the board appears resistant to detailed documentation. Yes. And indeed, if we go over the page, they raised the question of fitness and propriety. Yes, they did. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Memorandum to Mr Glenfield of 14 June 17 concerning IWF Prudential Review, APRA 0016-0010730, Exhibit 5.307. And you would have met with the board? I did. We went through this with the board. And did you form a view as to whether the board understood its obligations? Um, I think I've made it clear in the letters that I've written that I think they, um, they understood their obligations as an RE in terms of balance, but they were not fully understanding their fiduciary duty in terms of acting in the best interest of members. And our reviews and meetings with the board were to explain to them our view on that and to drive them towards a better understanding of what they were doing. And you sent another letter to them, which is Exhibit 5.124, IFL.0006.0003.3953. So this is a letter sent on the 15th of August 2017? It is correct. And if we go over the page to page two, Actually, I think we might need to go over to page three. You then provided them with a report on the prudential review of the IWF group. We did, yes. And then subsequently the ANZ transaction was announced. It was, yes. And You sent, I believe, a further letter to IWF when that happened, which is Exhibit SG-1-23 to Mr Glenfield's statement, which is APRA.0002.0007.2874. Yes, correct. And then you sent another letter to them in June, which is SG1-16, which is APRA.0002.0007.3219. And here, what was set out, well, I think this wasn't written by you, this was written by somebody else, was the minimum expectations that APRA was looking for from IOOF? That's correct, yes. Which were to split the board? Correct. And to do some other things? Correct. And, I'm sorry, I said split the board. To split the RSE RA, licensee the RA, and the RSE functions, yes. And as we understand it, and I assume as you understand it, the IOOF board met on the 1st of August to discuss this? I understand they did, yes. And have they formally communicated to APRA what their position is? Um, they've written a letter back to the team that now handles IWF, yes. I see, yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I've just been handed a letter which is dated the 14th of August 2018 from IWF to APRA where What's said is that APRA's suggested changes numbers one, three, and four were endorsed. And in respect of change two, 
there are some matters for discussion. That's as I understand it, yes. All right. I might, we'll get that marked, Commissioner, as it doesn't have a doc ID at the moment and tendered. But if, if it becomes Exhibit 5.308, letter IWF to APRA, 14 August 18, we'll get it into the system. Thank you, Commissioner. And you're aware when Mr Kelleher gave evidence that when he was asked, you don't share the view of APRA that there are legitimate concerns about these structures. It's just ultimately as a matter of practicality, it's easier to make the changes rather than having to keep dealing with the complaints. His answer was yes. I am aware of that, yes. And what I wonder about is this, whether APRA regards this as a successful intervention in relation to governance and management of a trustee? Good question. I regard it as an ongoing matter, but in terms of, of what we are trying to achieve with IWF. So if you think with IWF, with the, the challenge with the dual hat is, as we've been through, is you've you're wearing, and you do refer to it, which hat am I wearing today? Um, we're wearing a hat of an RE and an RSE. The overriding obligation of the RSEL is to act in the interests of members. Um, we've had concern over time that they weren't fully conversant with that requirement, and that's what's appeared in some of those matters like the pursuit and the quest or type matter. So I've looked at that as being they're, they're symptoms of, to go into a medical style, they're symptoms of a, a greater illness, which was the, their inability to manage the conflict in their RSE, RE. So we've taken the view to drive them to better practice, to get, a, a, to get it into a, a form whereby they are acting in the interests of members at all time. So that's to get it into a long-term position that the members of IWF will be given priority. So we took, we've taken a number of measures through those reviews to have the conflicts framework improved and bettered. Uh, we got the first step of getting two independent directors onto the board who would act purely with a hat for being there for the members. Uh, the key point we had was the Ernst and Young review to help look deeper into how they're managing conflict, uh, how they're dealing with the dual hat, and what they need to do to make that work better. Um, ultimately, however, we reached the conclusion that it wasn't working. So that was the June 2018 letters requiring the splitting of the two. So to my view, if we end up in a position with the RSEL being separated from the RE, with a fully independent board on the RSEL that acts in the interests of the members of the superannuation fund from a long-term view, that's a successful intervention. Just on the Ernst & Young review, that wasn't, as I recall it, that wasn't able to fully complete the checking of all tests because it effectively failed at the first or second hurdle. It Is hasn't a, failed at a hurdle, it's an ongoing review. I'm sorry, it wasn't at the time that the re initial report was given, it wasn't able to complete all of the checks. Is that right? Am I a check with my junior that I'm, think oh, I'm thinking think of a different review? Yeah. All right. There's an ongoing Ernst & Young review. Correct. And the ongoing Ernst & Young review has ultimately, you say, been superseded by... It hasn't been superseded. It, it, will, it will provide, um, I hope, some strong recommendations for further improvement around the way they manage, but we've taken the step of requiring the split to get what we think will be in the best interest of the members long term at IWF. Do you think, or did you give any consideration to whether, had you commenced a court proceeding against IWF in respect of any of the three breaches that we've spoken about, the cash management trust, the pursuit breach, the sweep breach, whether that might have more effectively operated as a deterrent specifically to IWF and generally to all RSE licensees? 
Okay. I gave it consideration definitely for our for IWF, which is why we ran we ran it through the EEC. That went through our legal area in for our litigation team, and they concluded that I didn't have enough. But that's for the CMT. That was for the CMT. So. On that basis, I redoubled the efforts towards getting the best structure in place for the long term. Um, in terms of general deterrence across the industry, I didn't turn my mind to that factor. What about the pursuit breach and the sweep breach? Did anyone consider that? No, the, well, again, I, the, I regarded the pursuit um, breach sitting back and looking at the work that the team was doing. Again, as I said, it's a symptom of the way the structure was working. For me, the most important thing was to get the structure right first for the long term. And we're in a position you can still consider those matters going forward. But in terms of the long term outcome for the members of IWF, the most important thing in my mind was to get the structure right and the governance and conflicts management right. Commissioner, I don't have any further questions for this witness. Thank you very much. Mr. Nothing, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, you may step down, you are excused. Ah, Mr Hodge. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr Kell from ASIC. Actually, I'm sorry, I think it's Mr Mullally from ASIC. I've just received a look, which tells me <laughs> I had it wrong. Would it be convenient if we took a five minute break now to switch around, or would you prefer to have lunch now and then come back at 1.45? How much time have we got in the afternoon? Uh, that is, if we broke now and resumed at 2, are we going to finish comfortably or not? We'll finish. I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that vote of confidence. Uh, I think then we'll resume at quarter to 2. Thank you, Commissioner.